Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us this evening for another in the Public Lands Council webinar series to bring information to permittees and our partners around the West. This evening's webinar is different than others that we've done so far. Today's webinar features a presentation by Dr. John Tanaka and Casey Dollarshell. Several years ago, Dr. Tanaka and Ms. Dollarshell sought funding from the Public Lands Council during our annual grant process. They were successful in this application and conducted the work that you're going to hear about tonight using that funding. Often we discuss the value of investments permittees make in their federal allotments as a benefit to the agencies, to other users of the landscape and to the ecosystems. But often we don't take time to fully appreciate that those investments are also costs for the permittees and their underlying operation. And sometimes those costs are significant. Permittees pay to access allotments and also incur all sorts of other costs that sometimes might be tough to tally in any given year. To begin this evening, I'm going to turn to Dr. John Tanaka, a good friend of mine and certainly one of PLCs as well. Dr. Tanaka is a professor emeritus at the University of Wyoming where, despite his recent retirement, he remains engaged in all things sustainability, rangelands, and ecosystems. Dr. Tanaka, thank you for joining us this evening. Please tell us a little bit about the, the project that we're going to hear about tonight and, and your work with Casey over the last several years. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, again, I'm John Tanaka. Um, I guess you've pretty much covered most of the project. You know, the, the uh, non-fee costs um, actually started back in the 1960s and then Neil Rimby, Alan Terrell and Tom Bartlett and several others uh, did a study in the early 1990s to update those and Casey may talk a little bit about that as well. Um, and we thought it was just a, a prime opportunity to be able to update the data. Uh, been you know well over 20 years, well, maybe almost closer to 30 years before uh, it was done before. And so um, Christy Masco who's the executive director of the Sustainable Rangelands Roundtables, actually the one that wrote the, the proposal to you guys to, to fund the project and has been helping direct the, the project through its entirety. Um, and so with that, I'll introduce Casey. Casey came to the University of Wyoming to do her master's degree uh, from Colorado State University where she got her range degree down there. Um, I think grew up in Grand Junction, um, or at least lived there a long time, <laughs> and um, we we're pleased that we were able to get her to, to come to the university and, and work on this particular project. Um, she's now, um, I guess, a full-time employee of the Natural Resources Conservation Service down in um, Greeley, uh, and with that, I'll turn it over to you, Casey. Perfect, thank you, John. Um, so as John said, Casey Dollarshell, um, and you pretty much covered it, um, graduated from the University of Wyoming, working on this project, um, evaluating the grazing permit costs, AKA the non-fee costs of federal land grazing. Um, so just wanna thank Public Lands Council for um, letting me do this and present all of our results. It's been kind of a long time coming, so um, hopefully we can, get through it and just see kind of what all the results are. And so special thanks to Caitlin and Allie. You guys have been so helpful in getting this project not only up and running, but just completed. Um, helped me so much in letting me present at PLC meetings and various other meetings as well. Um, and kind of like John said, I'd like to thank um, Christy Masco for help with the Sustainable Rangelands Roundtable. And again, just kind of kickstarting this project. And then special thanks to John. Um, like it was mentioned, he was retired and he was trying to enjoy his time off and I just kept bugging him with questions. So thank you so much for all the support during this. All right, can't get that. So kind of how this structure of this is gonna go is I'm gonna give 
a brief history on kind of, you know, where this project started and Caitlin did um, touch a little bit on this as well, where it started and then how our project came to be. And then I will go into, you know, what we wanted to get done with this project. And then I am gonna go through the methods, kind of how we got there, um, cause it's important to just kind of know how we got to these numbers and what exactly they were. And then of course we'll share the results. Um, and then do want to leave plenty of time at the end for some discussion and any questions. So if anybody has any questions, I believe Caitlin's going to be or Ali's going to be monitoring the chat. Um, so if you have a question, just feel free to put it in there or hold, hold it until the end and we'll definitely get there at the end. Like I said, when I leave plenty of time for that. So brief history. So this all kind of started in the mid 60s where they just there had been talk about all of these non fee costs. And when I say non fee costs, I mean any costs associated with livestock grazing that isn't that federal grazing fee itself. And so they just kind of had a goal of finding out what exactly these costs are, you know, all of those costs associated with grazing that isn't that grazing fee. So they came up with the 14 categories that we still consider to be non-fee costs today. And I'm gonna go through each of these individually. Um, I apologize, I know a lot of people have heard this talk, but there are some people joining us that this project might be completely new to them. So I do wanna just make sure we go over all of these categories so that as we're going through the results and everything, you know exactly where those costs are coming from. So we'll start out with lost animals. So this is the value of any livestock that either died or disappeared on a lease or allotment, obviously, while they were on it. Um, this can obviously be from natural death or just not finding the animal when it's time to move um, off the allotment. Association fees are any dues, fees, um, or any assessments done for a grazing association. Vet bills, so this is any vet and medicine expenses for either a sick or injured animal while they were on a lease or allotment. So, you know, any of the bills, materials, medicine, anything like that, we do want to account for that um, in these costs. So moving livestock, so this is any um, either vehicle expenses or labor. Um, for the vehicle, we tend to stick more towards the gas used and then labor, obviously, the hourly wage that, wage, wage that you um, pay. And this is for any expenses to move the livestock either on or off the allotment. Um, and this can include any hired trucking. So it's just getting those animals to the allotment and then back off again. Then comes herding. So this is while they're on the allotment. If you move them around, um, you know, if you're rotational grazing or anything like that or doing any kind of herding, this again is the vehicle miles and the labor hours it required to move those animals around. This also includes any um, periodic checking of the animals. You know, if you're going to that lease or allotment every few days just to check on things, this is where we would account for those miles and those labor hours. Salt and feed, so this is any of the salt, feed, supplements, minerals um, given to the animals while they are on a lease or allotment. And then travel, so this is all of the kind of expenses that come to a producer for that land just not being their private land. So any, you know, vehicle or again, labor hours to go to meetings, you know, to meet with that landlord or to meet with that federal agency. Um, and this is a little bit more towards the federal side, but it can happen on private leases as well. If, you know, especially on federal with that multiple use, if there are any gates left open or fence cut and you do have strays get out, this is where we would account for all those miles and hours to get them back in and just deal with very other various problems or problems associated with um, just not that land being your private land and you not being able to maybe keep as many people off of it besides you. So water, this is any cost for pumping water or any, if you have to haul water to a lease or allotment. Um, this also, again, just those vehicle miles or if you have to pay for water, anything like that. Horse costs, so this is just the cost of using horses while those animals are on the lease or allotment. Um, again, this accounts for moving, herding, maintenance, whatever you're using horses for, this is where we would account for that cost. And then maintenance. So this is the labor, the vehicle miles, the materials, the equipment, all to improve and then maintain all those improvements that you've made either on a lease or allotment. So all the fencing, wells, stock ponds, roads, any of that maintenance costs is where we would account for it in this category. 
which then leads to the developments themselves. So this is where we would account for depreciation and costs on any developments on that lease or allotment that the producer had to pay for themselves. So this is their personal costs, their hours, their vehicle expenses. Maybe if they put in materials, this is where we'd account for all of those costs. And then other costs of so this, we had a special section that took into account predator control or any insect control. Um, this is pretty much we'd get to the end of the pack and, and if a producer felt like we didn't maybe capture a cost that they had while they were out on a lease or allotment, this is where we try to account for that. You know, for our sheep producers, this a lot of the time this is where dog food went or any of just having a person out there with them 24 seven, there are extra costs to that for sheep producers. So we tried to account for that here. And then we did add another section of technology. So this section was not part of those original categories that they came up with in the 60s, but we did feel like it was kind of up and coming cost producers. You know, you are investing in GPS units and radios, and we even had a couple of producers investing in drones because it's just convenient and, you know, it's a way to keep your workers safe. And so this is a kind of an up and coming cost and we did want to include it in this study. And then for the private lease, um, privately leased land, we did include that private lease rate. So what they are paying a landlord to graze out on their land, um, we did account for in the survey and in the total non-fee costs. So using those 14 categories, they conducted a study in 1966 um, using the Western Livestock Grazing Survey. And what they pretty much wanted to do is be, say, we have these categories now knowing what these non-fee costs are. So we pretty much just want to add up all of the total non-fee costs for those that graze on federal land and all the total non-fee costs of those that graze on privately leased land, add it up and pretty much see what the difference is. So that is what we're calling the total cost approach. At the time, they found a difference of about $1.23 per AUM, per animal unit per month. And this was said to be the value of grazing on public land, or there's no hidden secret. Private land tends to be in a little bit better located areas. It tends to just be a little bit better forage. When people are homesteading, you know, they knew what grass was better. And so they popped, went there. And so um, this is said to be, you know, that next best thing. So what a federal land permittee would be willing to pay for the next best thing. So this, this was then said to be the value of public land grazing. So fast forward a little bit to 1978. Um, they, the Public Range Land Improvement Act just kind of set out to establish a universal grazing fee between the federal agencies. So what they decided to do is take that $1.25 per AUM and adjust it annually based on what the private lease rates were doing, the price for received for beef, and then the cost of producing beef. And then this would be the amount that was charged per AUM for a federal permittee to graze on federal land. This formula was um, set to be evaluated after a seven year period. Flash forward to 1986, there was an, an executive order passed stating that the formula was here to stay, but they did raise that base forage value from $1.23 to $1.35 per AUM, and that's where it stands today. So flash forward again, a couple more years, and there was just kind of a pressing need to update and reevaluate these non-fee costs. You know, there'd been different studies evaluating the fee and evaluating what these costs were, but there wasn't any concrete data that had been gathered since that 1960s project where, you know, you just added up all of those non-fee costs of federal land grazing and compared it to that of privately leased grazing. So the Grazing Fee Task Group was formed. It was made up of multiple researchers from multiple universities, and they worked really closely with the BLM and Forest Service at the time. So they decided to cut, conduct all of their research in three states, which was Wyoming, Idaho, and New Mexico. And so they were tasked, this was a big project. So they were tasked with multiple different objectives. They had a lot of different goals, but we're gonna focus on their way of valuing public land grazing or valuing that forage. So they went through a couple of different methods, including the permit value, production analysis, competitive bidding, all those different um, methods to maybe value forage. We're gonna stick to the market value, which has that total cost approach um, study under it. So this is again where you just add up all of those non-fee costs and see what the difference is. And then they did decide to divide it between sheep and cattle. Um, so they did divide out those costs between the two livestock. 
So what they found is a difference of about $5.41 per AUM for sheep with the cost actually being higher on federal land. And then they found a difference of about 89 cents per AUM for cattle with it actually being a little bit higher on um, private land. So again, here we are, we're kind of at that 30 year mark. So it's, you know, the 60s, the 90s, here we are again at that 30 mark. And there just hasn't been any data collected. Again, that concrete data that's looking at all of those non-fee costs for those that graze on federal land and those that graze on privately leased land. So we had a goal of pretty much just mimicking that 1990 study as closely as we possibly can just to see where exactly those numbers are, you know? So we wanted to see if it's still close to that $5.41 for sheep, or is it still close to that 89 cents for cattle? Um, so we just had a goal of following it, using that total cost approach as closely as we could. So we wanted to collect the data, analyze it, and interpret it the same way that they did for that 1990s project. And so in order to do this, um, and this was chosen in collaboration with Public Lands Council, we decided to conduct all of the research in Wyoming and Idaho. This overlapped with two of the states from the 1990s study. And then we did add a new state of California. Um, and this does just kind of open up the door for this, you know, to take place in other states as well. And so that's why California was kind of a good um, addition to this study. And so again, our goal was just to compare the total costs, um, non-fee costs of grazing on public land and compare it to those that graze on privately leased land. And then we did, you know, since we've had three studies now, wanted to see if there was a trend we could possibly see, you know, are those costs going up? Are they going down? Where they're going up exactly? So how we wanted to do it, we did want a 90% confidence level, 10% margin of error. So what we needed was 68 allotments, federal allotments for Wyoming and Idaho, and then we needed about 64 of them for California. So how we got to this is we gathered a list of federal permittees um, from Wyoming Soccer Association, Idaho Cattle Association, and California Cattlemen's Association. And these included permittees from both BLM and Forest Service. We didn't know which one um, each allotment or producer was grazing on, but they both were included in the list. And so from that, we generated a random sample of permittees from each of the lists from each of the states. And following that, we sent out a packet to everyone on that sample list. So um, we included two cover letters. One was from myself from the university, and then we had a joint cover letter with PLC and the state association, a consent form, and then we did send out that interview packet. And this packet was the exact same packet they used in the 1992 study, obviously just updated to the current year. Um, we took all of our information from the year 2018. So it was just kind of a way to keep everything universal and to take from one specific year um, to keep things consistent. You know, some people's costs might have been a little higher that year. Some people's costs may have been a little lower than usual. So that balanced out and it just helps to keep it consistent with choosing one specific year. And then again, we did add that section of technology at the end of the packet. And the idea of sending the packet is just, you know, give people a heads up of what questions we're going to be asking. It's a 15 page packet. Um, it's pretty extensive. And so just kind of wanted people to understand what kind of questions we were going to be asking. So after that packet was sent up, um, we, I did um, send out a few follow-up calls where it was possible, where I had phone numbers. Um, due to a low response rate in all three states, two follow-up letters were follow, or followed that, and along with two um, follow-up calls just due to that kind of low response rate. So for the state of Idaho, um, we were able to reach our desired sample size after that first sample. Um, and this is because we are working on a joint project with the Idaho Department of Lands. Um, they wanted to gather information on the non-fee costs of state land grazing in the state of Idaho. So we used pretty much the exact same methods, exact same packet. And so we did travel together throughout, Wyoming, or throughout Idaho. So that joint effort did allow us to get to our desired sample size for the state of Idaho, for our federal allotments. However, we were not so lucky with Wyoming and California to do a low response rate. And I think even all said and done, our highest response rate was around six or 8%. Um, but we did decide to draw two additional samples and they received the same packet, the same amount of follow-up calls and um, the same follow-up letters as the first round did. 
So for private leases, so we did want to gather as many private leases as we can, you know, just the higher highest number is just easier to compare to those federal allotments. It is a smaller population. So just in general, there aren't as many private leases out there as there are um, federal permits. But we wanted to get as high a number as we can. In the 1990 study, they did go through the National Agriculture Statistics Service. We were not able to do that. They did provide them a list, um, but due to confidentiality, we were not able to go that route to obtain a list of private leases. Um, and they also went through, you know, extension agencies, um, associations, state associations. But again, just due to that confidentiality, we were not able to obtain any names or any private leases. So we ended up having to overlap a little bit in the fact that if a federal permittee also had a private lease, we would have them fill out the packet for that private lease as well. We also tried to put as announcements in as many places as we could. Public Lands Council, Wyoming Soccer Association, and California Cattlemen's Association were extremely helpful in letting us put announcements out there to try to get anybody who did have a private lease um, to maybe fill out our packet for us. So for after that, after a producer contacted me saying that they wanted to participate in the study, we did try to set up an in-person interview. This is what they did in the 90s as well. Just again, because that packet is 16 pages, lots of questions come up. Um, there's some, a lot of details. So we wanted to be there with them in case, you know, there was any confusion or like I said, any questions did come up while filling that out. So that took place for all of Idaho and part of Wyoming. We did do those in-person interviews. Then 2020 hit, and as we all know, um, COVID-19 kind of put a dent in everybody's plans. So, of course, there were travel restrictions put on us by the University of Wyoming and the world, pretty much. And so that was after our first round of packets was sent out to California. So we were able to get half of Wyoming in in-person interviews, but all of California was looking like it was all going to have to take place not in person. So for the remaining packets that were completed, they were either filled out over a phone interview, you know, where the producer had the packet in front of them. I had a packet and I was just kind of copying down what they said. Or I did give them the option to fill the packet out on their own time and send it back to me. When this was the case, I did try to keep pretty close contact, um, again, just in case any questions came up. And then when I did receive the packet back, you know, if I needed any clarification or if something didn't quite look right, it was really nice to be able to call that producer and just get the answers and get some clarification on parts of the packet. So what we ended up doing at the end is we took all those total costs, kind of the same way they did in the 60s and the 90s, added up all of those non-fee costs for those that graze on federal land and also those that graze on privately leased land. And we added it on, ended up being a total cost per AUM. So, you know, you'd get that total cost and then you just divide it out by how many AUMs were in that allotment. And we did also break that down, those costs down into all those categories, you know, so you have your total costs and then all of those separate categories in that price per AUM. So you could kind of see, you know, what categories were a little bit higher, which ones were a little low and things like that. They also did that in the 1990s project. So now we'll get on to our results um, and then end with a little discussion, obviously. And so I'm going to cover kind of our total numbers, you know, where we ended up with all of our allotments and our private leases and whatnot. And then I'm going to go into our total numbers for private and um, public, so that federal land and the privately leased land. And then they did do this in the 90s as well, where they did do those total cost comparisons between BLM and Forest Service land, just to kind of see what the difference was between the two agencies, because the total costs, obviously for the public, for the federal, were those two agencies combined. So we didn't break it out between BLM and Forest Service and then compared to private, we just totaled all federal land grazing up. And then we will break it, break it down and give totals for by allotment size. So we split it up medium or small, medium, large, like I said, they did that in the 90s as well. And you'll be able to see that. I'll put those numbers up side by side. And then I do over, want to go over some additional considerations. Um, we tried our best to quantify all of these costs and to find a category for all these costs. But there were some costs that we just couldn't quantify. But they still do add a level of cost or stress for the producer. And so I want those to be taken into consideration too here at the end. 
So pretty much where we ended up is we had about 69 federal allotments for the state of Wyoming with 14 private leases. And then Idaho, we ended up with about 89 allotments with 18 private leases. California, we ended up with about 49 allotments and 16 private leases. And then as you can see here, it is broken up by BLM Forest Service, private, and then how many producers. Um, so if a producer had more than one allotment, we did split those costs up into multiple allotments um, just because we all know allotments can cost, um, can be very different in cost, you know, depending on location, things like that. And it was on a per allotment basis. So we weren't going off producers as a whole. We were going off those individual allotments. And so before we start getting into the total totals, I just wanted to go through those 14 categories and kind of explain, you know, where there are areas that they can be higher on, potentially be higher on federal land um, and potentially higher on private land. We weren't able to do a st official statistical analysis that says, you know, there is a statistical difference in this category between private and federal land. Um, we were, were in the works of hopefully getting that completed, um, but for right now, we're just giving total numbers. Um, and obviously you can kind of take those and interpret how you will, um, but we weren't able to actually, you know, tell you for sure that there is a statistical analysis. So you kind of just get the view of the outside looking in. We aren't really able to give you a view of what's actually going on. But I do want to go through each of these categories because it can be interesting on, you know, some can be higher than others as far as on federal or private. So for lost animals, um, it can be high on both private and federal. It does have the potential to be a little bit higher on federal land just due to the fact that usually those allotments are located away from ranch headquarters. So you're not always able to spend the time to go and check on the animals. Um, they also can be, especially for forest service on a little bit steeper terrain, rougher, things like that. So you just naturally can maybe have a few that die or you just never find them when it's time to move them off. Vet bills, this is pretty much can be the same for private and federal. Again, it could potentially be higher on federal just in the fact that you are rougher terrain, you are farther away, you're not checking on them as much, um, but you still have the same chance of having a sick or injured animal on private lease. Uh, moving and herding, again, just a little bit higher potential to be or higher on federal land just due to the fact that it is located sometimes away from ranch headquarters. So you do have to spend a little bit more time and mileage to get up there. Private leases, they might not be near your headquarter, but they tend to be, you know, where most people are located um, as to where got, uh, federal land can sometimes be located um, farther away. And again, with that travel, that's what that miscellaneous and mileage is. Um, this again can be pretty similar for the two just because you're meeting with either your landlord or the federal personnel to discuss things. And those are those hours and those miles put into that or any of the paperwork. Um, associated since both of them are obtaining costs that just because it's not their private land. So and feed again can be pretty similar between the two. It just that mostly is dependent on how many animals you have or if you are doing any type of herding around there. And then um, water. So again, can kind of, it just depends on if you have a water development on your private lease or federal allotment. The only difference here is on federal land, they are in charge most of the time of those, of those developments and of maintaining those developments. Sometimes on private leases, um, the rate is a little higher because the landlord will develop and take care of all of those developments. So not a lot of fence maintenance sometimes or water, things like that. As to where on federal land, um, permittees are in charge of all of those, including labor, materials, things like that. And so that's kind of the same thing with those developments themselves. Um, most of the time and not all private leases or private landlords will take those costs on for themselves. And then other costs, um, kind of like what I talked about before, there is a potential to have a little bit more predator control on federal allotments, again, just because they can be located in a little bit more remote areas, um, things like that. Um, but for, especially like I was saying, for our sheep producers, you do have somebody out there with them most of the time um, that are not as common on the private leases. They were a little bit more common on the federal allotments. So those costs did raise that category a little bit more. And again, that total labor and total vehicle mileage. So we included those in our maintenance and our moving and herding and things. 
So for the state of Wyoming, we ended up having a total non-fee cost difference of about a dollar and 59 cents, with this actually being a little bit higher on federal land. So we had a total non-fee cost of about $35.26 per AUM for federal land and $33.66 per AUM for private land for the state of Wyoming. Idaho, um, we ended up having a total cost for federal land of about $30.34. And then for private, we had a cost of about $36.32 per AUM with a difference of $5.98 per AUM, um, with that actually being higher on privately leased land. And then California, we had a total cost of about $30.06 per AUM for federal land and $40.88 for private leases um, with a difference about $10.81 per AUM for the state of California. And so here is kind of an overall total. So we took all of the totals for each state individually, and then we did do a three state weighted average. Um, so, you know, based on the amount of allotments they had, um, they had a little bit more weight on that three state average, but we came out for federal land at about an average of $31.67 per AUM. And again, in the year 2018. And then for private, we had an average difference of about $35.25. Um, per AUM, and this was a difference of about $3.58 overall between federal land and privately leased land in the year 2018. And so here, again, kind of mentioned we, are, we have three studies now, so we decided to kind of do a little side-by-side -side comparison. So all of these numbers have been updated to match the year 2018. So this is reflecting all of these on the same, um, you know, scale. And so in that 1966 study, in today's dollars, it was about $9.36 per AUM difference. That 90 study was looking at about $3.30 per AUM difference. And then we're looking at about $3.58 um, per AUM difference. Um, so as you can see, not uh, kind of went up and then down and uh, slightly up again, very slightly. And um, have to keep in mind the 1960 study did have a, a little more couple more samples, they definitely had a higher number, as did the 1990 study. So do have to take that into account as we didn't have quite as many numbers to compare. So moving on to BLM and Forest Service. And um, so we'll start with the state of Wyoming. So they ended up having a difference of about $20.28 per AUM between BLM and Forest Service with costs being higher on Forest Service. Um, and I'll go through these categories again, kind of just to explain where the cost difference can come from um, and why it could potentially be higher on that Forest Service. Again, none of this has statistical analysis um, inside. So this is just kind of from the outside looking in. But those lost animals, Forest Service, kind of like I've mentioned, just tends to be in a little bit rougher terrain, more remote. Um, so, and large, um, that's both for BLM and Forest Service, but um, so, you know, you just have a little higher chance of animal injury or you're not able to get out there as often and check on them. And also when it comes time to move with those large allotments, especially in forested areas, it's hard to find all um, the animals. Vet bills, kind of, they were pretty much the same. It was a little higher on BLM, but again, just not checking on it maybe as frequently or rougher terrain can kind of have to do with it. Um, and then moving and herding livestock can potentially be higher on Forest Service, again, just because especially Forest Service can be pretty far from the headquarters. You know, you have that extra gas, you have that extra labor to get there. Um, and then again, forested area, it tends to be pretty rough terrain. It can just take longer to get livestock on and off and also moved around while you're in there. Salt and feed, pretty similar. Again, it just kind of depends on where you're trying to herd, um, things like that. And then travel was pretty similar for both of them, just in the fact that they're both working with federal agencies for meetings or um, travel especially be, can, can be higher on federal land um, for both BLM and Forest Service, just in the fact that um, you know, you're dealing with that not being your personal land. They do have to, um, use multiple use. So you have other users on that land as well. Again, there can be gates left open, things like that. And then water. So water was actually 
tend usually was higher on BLM and can potentially be higher on BLM just because a lot of the time forest service comes with some kind of water source you know there's just a higher chance that there being a creek or a spring or something up there as to where BLM tends to be on a little you know more flat ground and just not having as many creeks and things run through there so they're usually in charge of water developments and maintaining those water developments so that always can usually be higher on BLM not always and then kind of it goes along with that maintenance um or the horse cost was a pretty even. Um, again, for a service, you can just have higher horse costs. With rougher terrain, you might not be able to use, you know, UTVs or anything to get around quite as frequently. Maintenance, um, again, can kind of be higher on forest service just because, again, they can be um, farther away, a little rougher terrain to get to fencing, to get to wells or springs. Um, roads can be a huge cost here. Um, especially with that multiple use and you have OHVs or whatever going up and down those roads, it can be a huge cost for both BLM and for Forest Service permittees because they are in charge of all of the maintenance of the roads on that allotment. Same with those development depreciation or the developments just in general, they are in, are in charge of all of them. So we didn't see a huge difference between BLM and Forest Service because again, BLM, you're maybe doing a couple more water developments. Forest Service, um, maybe a little bit more fencing and it just can be a little more maintenance and things like that on the fencing and can just take longer because of the rough terrain to get it in there. Um, and those other costs, Again, predator control, especially Forest Service, can be located in a little bit more remote areas, so they might be investing more in, um, in that predator control. And again, just farther away, you're using more gas or, you know, if you're paying a herder to be out there 24-7 and they're coming back frequently or you're running supplies up to them, it can just cost a little bit more. And technology, we didn't see a huge difference just because usually... For both BLM and Forest Service, you're using radios, you're using GPS, things like that. So that's kind of a breakdown of where those costs can be different um, between BLM and Forest Service. Again, we from the outside looking in. And then for the state of Idaho, there was a difference of about $5.81 per AUM, with that actually being higher on BLM. And then for California, we had a difference of about $7.97 with those costs being higher on Forest Service for California. So again, we kind of have those numbers from the 1990 study to compare to um, this study. Um, those values, again, were updated to 2018. So as you can see for, and then we did add private in here, so we could compare BLM to Forest Service to private once again. So you can see in 1990s, it was highest on Forest Service. Um, and that, again, just tends to just be in a little bit rougher terrain, harder to get to, located farther away. Um, and then for ours, it was first higher on Forest Service and then highest on those private leases between BLM and Forest Service, which is kind of what we saw before. So the 1990s did do an additional breakdown of between allotments, and it's kind of just a way of comparing, you know, in your own class, your own size class. So you're not, you know, compared to an allotment that has a ton of AUMs and you're a pretty small allotment. So in this, we did do for private, for BLM and for service, obviously, regardless of um, livestock. And I did not mention that earlier. They broke it down between sheep and cattle in the 1990s. We did not just because we didn't feel that we had enough um, sheep AUMs or sheep allotments or leases to kind of justify that end of the um, livestock industry. So we did just end up doing a weighted combination between the two. But they did split up the allotment size. So anything less than 500 AUMs was considered a small allotment size. Medium was from that 500 to 1,000. And then a large was anything over 1,000 AUMs. They did also do an additional kind of XL category where it was anything above 3,000 AUMs. We decided not to do that because I think we only had like one or two allotments that would have actually been in that category and they would have just been compared to one another. So what we found is for the highest cost tended to be on the small allotments for everyone but BLM. So for private and forest service, um, those prices were highest on small and then for BLM it was on medium. And this just kind of because you have fixed costs with livestock grazing no matter, you know, 
how many AUMs you have. You have fixed labor wages. You have fixed gas prices. You have this, you have to invest in the same amount of money into the same equipment to maybe use. You're just spreading that cost out over a fewer amount of AUMs. So those small allotments, you know, you have all those fixed costs. You have that equipment. You're just not running as much on it, and it's a pretty small allotment. So obviously, your costs are just going to be a little bit higher because you're just not spreading it out as much. So again, we compared that to the 1992 study, um, and they did found, find pretty consistently that things were higher on smaller allotments, again, just because you're not spreading that cost out as much. Um, and then for us, we found that with private and the Forest Service. A BLM medium, um, I think we did have just a couple more medium-sized allotments, so um, I think that did reflect in this and the fact that it was just a little bit higher for medium, but again, you still have those fixed costs and AU 500 to 1,000 AUMs, you're still not, you may not be spreading it over quite as much. And we did have a lot of allotments that were in that just above 500 AUMs. So you still don't have that many AUMs, but you do have all those fixed costs. So other considerations. So these are kind of just, like I said, when we got to the end of the packet and there were things that came up in discussion that we just weren't able to put a dollar amount to. So we weren't able to add it in to this total cost. So the first one being wear and tear on vehicles was a huge one. And we could have done, you know, depreciation work and stuff like that, but it's hard to say that you only use that vehicle on either a, pri or a federal allotment or a private lease. So we couldn't really only put all of those costs into that, you know, one category, that one allotment. So, but there is wear and tear on vehicles getting to and from leases and allotments that is an added cost to the producer you know that vehicle maybe just won't last as long or it's in the shop all the time you know there are added costs especially on especially on those forest service lands you know where they're pretty remote and it tends to be a little bit more rough terrain rough roads things like that and then we found this especially in idaho with just an increase in predation of wolves that didn't or any other predator didn't have to be wolves that just didn't cause a direct death so we couldn't really count it as a lost animal um but you know some would come back without tails or ears or you know the stress and the breeding the next season had an effect on that too so we couldn't really quantify that but that is something to take into consideration just the increase of predation and that kind of goes along with multiple use. Um, this is especially true, obviously, for our federal permittees. Um, just in the added expenses of you having to share that land with other users. So you can't lock people out. They can come in with they, when they want. And we did try to quantify, you know, when you spent hours rounding up strays or you had to repair any vandalism or, you know, cut fence. Those things were a little bit easier to quantify. Which wasn't was again that kind of OH view use tearing up roads, which you might not have to do direct work on the roads, but it's rougher on your vehicle, um, or the stress from livestock. You know, especially with the increase in OHB use, um, with just more interaction between the machines and the animals, can just cause a little added stress to both the livestock and the producer. Um, and then again, just those water developments, we could quantify those, but. Um, there were a lot of times, you know, where they just the vandalism was hard to keep up with or shooting at tanks and maybe not causing a ton of damage, but causing enough that that tank's not going to last as long, kind of things like that. So in conclusion, um, again, we kind of just have those three studies that we've been looking at, where in the 1966 study, they had that $9.36 per AUM difference, the 92 study about a $3.30 per AUM difference, and then we're sitting at about that $5.58. And then in general, again, we can't formally conclude this, but costs tend to be a little bit higher on forest service and have the potential to be higher on forest service for the states of Wyoming and California. Um, they were higher in Idaho overall for BLM. And then in our study as well, small allotments just tend to be and have the highest potential to have higher costs just because, um, again, you're just spreading your fixed costs over a smaller amount of AUMs. So what does this all mean? We're kind of, you know, we've found this value, we found this number, what does that really mean going forward? You know, what is the implication for all this? So finding this total non-fee difference of $3.58, kind of going back to that 60 study, you know, that's 
what producers are willing to pay for the next best forage, you know, and if you look at it kind of private lease races or leases rates can go either from $10 to $30 per AUM while that federal grazing fee tends to stick around, you know, that $1.35 and up. So when you take a look back, that's a pretty big difference. But when you add in all of these non-feed costs, there really is only that difference of $3.58 per AUM. And again, that is higher on private, but that would be the cost that a producer would be willing to pay to graze on that private land. And so this is the price that's pretty much making those two types of grazing fair. That $3.58 would be the fair price um, to charge, to make it just all universal. Everybody's kind of paying the same price to graze on federal and then privately leased land. Of course, you have to take into consideration, this is just for the year 2018, and this is just for the states of Wyoming, Idaho, and California. And as we know, especially for the federal grazing fee, that's kind of a nationwide thing. So it does have to be taken into account that this is just for three states which leads into the importance of kind of continuing this analysis, not just for Wyoming and Idaho and California, but opening it up to as many states as we can. You know, if you have this information by a region, we all know that costs are way different depending on where you live and what state and what part of the country. So it's kind of just important to understand where these non-fee costs are for those that graze on private lease land and those that graze on federal land um, and just, understand the similarities and the differences and you know where they're located and then again you can just more data leads to maybe a higher conclusion in what that um, amount could be to make the two types of grazing equal or even um, and so that kind of concludes this i do want to give a special thanks again to john tanaka and christy masco just for all of the help and support through this project, um, just as much as our project as mine. And then special, special thanks, I believe he's on here, but Tom Hilkin, he was the research assistant um, for the Idaho Department of Lands Project. And he had to deal with many, many days and many hours in the car with me in Idaho and <laughs> listening to me chat away and um, blow him out with heat because I was always cold and that he was not because it was not cold outside. So it's just special thanks to Tom. And then again, for Public Lands Council, um, Caitlin and Allie, like I said, have just been so helpful during this whole thing, just helping me um, talk and get announcements out there. And then special thanks to Jim McGagna with Wyoming Stock Growers Association, incredibly helpful. Um, he actually took the list that they used in the 1990s and updated it for producer information. So we were actually able to have a couple of overlapping producers, which was pretty cool. So um, huge thanks to him as well. And then same with Karen Williams over at Idaho Cattle Association. Um, and for all of the support and getting that state done. And then um, huge, huge thanks to Kirk Rober. He was with California Cattlemen's Association. Again, um, had that trouble of it being all over the phone or not being able to be in person. And he was great with getting announcements out into their publications and things like that. So just special thanks to everyone. And I think with that, we'll open it up for questions. Well, thanks so much, Casey, and, and thanks for sharing this this information. I know that you have, have shared this information in a variety of, of locations and venues um, over, over the last couple of years, but I think really tying this all together is helpful not only for our producers, but, but also for those who are, are looking at some of the, the factors um, and, and the investments that, that are made in these public lands. We, we know, and I think you said at the beginning, that a lot of these landscapes are marginal. You know, these, these were not private lands for a reason. They were established as, as public lands, as, as held in trust um, by the federal government because they weren't private lands. And, and so this valuation is particularly interesting. We're going to start uh, with some questions. We have a question here in, in the chat. And for all of those of you who are online, please do submit questions uh, in the chat, either through the Q&A function or through that little button at the bottom of your screen entitled chat. Uh, we will uh, go ahead and, and put those uh, together and put those to Casey and, and to John as appropriate. The first question is coming to you from Wyoming. Um, that, you know, this year has brought uh, a variety of, of different factors that, that may or may not have, have been considered in your work. You know, given that this analysis was done with data from 2018, 
what are some of those factors that you find really interesting? You know, a lot of researchers say they've done the work and they've done, they, wor they work with the data set that they have, um, but then they see some of these additional factors coming up. What do you think either in future research or uh, in emerging conditions that you've seen um, is, is one of the most interesting variables that, that uh, federal lands permittees and, and, and agencies are going to have to consider going forward? Um, I mean, I think the first one that comes to mind, and we discussed it a little bit, um, I guess, with the state of California, but as we were doing the study, um, you know, and kind of finishing it up, they had all of those fires last year, and I think that's one large consideration, you know, um, we didn't have too many producers that had to deal with um, pretty bad fires or anything like that in 2017. There were some, um, but it wasn't such a huge consideration. And I, and obviously there are, you know, federal regulations that sometimes don't allow, I think that really never do, allow you to go back on and graze that following year following a fire. So things like that, that's, you know, that's your summer grass. That's a time you spent for months out there. And now you're having to kind of scramble and figure out, you know, do you invest in any more animals you sell what do you do you buy hay which that price is crazy right now too so um i think the 2018 data was a little bit different from you know what we saw in 2020 um and just things like that and um plants getting shut down you know not being able to go to work things like that that again um that's not so much to do with federal regulation but those would be very add like really high added cost because you know you might not be able to go out on allotment or things like that that would be important to consider kind of in the future i believe i i think that's the, i think that's right i mean you certainly have different resource management conditions across um these these federal landscapes that that really are out of your control not only fire but but multiple use and and you know other uh, other considerations that that really just aren't there on on private or on state or even on leased land our next question uh is coming uh to you uh said thank you for the presentation um and the, this person is wondering whether you heard from producers uh with uh impacts that they have seen or interactions that they have seen where their grazing allotment um, where it was, was adjacent or, or nearby to a herd management area uh, for, for BLM uh, managed horses and burrows under that wild horse and burrow management program? Honestly, that didn't come up um, too, too much. Um, didn't really have anybody um, located next to any of those areas that I can remember. Um, if Tom's on here, um, we, he might have, I don't know if we heard anything like that, but I'm not recalling much. We did have a couple of wilderness area concerns, you know, just because, again, there's more regulation on those of no OHV use or especially certain times of the years for those, but I don't remember anything specifically with herd management areas. Thanks, Casey. And, and to add a little bit of color, I mean, I think that that makes sense because we do see um, conditions on herd management areas on, on these HMAs that really have precluded a lot of grazing over time. And, and so I, I think there are generally very few areas where you would have that overlap. Um, so it, it's interesting to see that that, that bore out in, in the work that you did. We have another question coming in about whether your work looked at the added costs uh, of, of operations in extreme dry conditions, obviously very relevant this year, um, and, and whether you had assessed the added cost of hauling water and, and other practices that, that may not have been done in any given year. Understanding that you're looking at, at a single year data through 2018, were there some of these either geographically inspired conditions or, or did you allow for some of that analysis of, of uh, other sort of emergency conditions that, that are occurring uh, in a year like this one? Um, yes, and I mean, when that was kind of the case, we did try to account for, especially that hauling water or not, we weren't really able to quantify if you had to come off earlier than you were expecting, you know, due to drought or you had to wait a bit, long, bit longer to go on. Um, that should have been part of our considerations um, that we, you can't really quantify just because we were trying to gather data while you're on an allotment. Um, maybe could have, you know, gathered that with hay purchased, you know, during that time. Um, but again, that would have been a little bit more difficult. But 
didn't really find any time to our places to kind of put that. Um, again, we did try to account for hauling water. Um, we did have a couple of producers, especially in that um, southwestern part of Idaho that were dealing a lot with um, weed management. And, you know, that had kind of shifted when they could go on, when they had to come off and, you know, just the quality of the forage they were getting out there because, um, as you know, Medusa, Ventnata, all those are large problems up there, kind of the way most of us are dealing with cheatgrass as well. So that also was a discussion and, um, you know, just not having the forage quality so you weren't able to have as many animals out there. Um, and again, if you had to go on early or later due to the lack of forage, especially in those drier areas. So weren't really able to quantify um, those specific, but we did try to, you know, if you did have to haul water or if you did have to haul hay up there, we did account for that um, when we could, but we couldn't really account for, you know, if you had to hay a little longer um, in the fall or in the winter or whatever, if you were usually used to being on that land. Great, thank you. I think we'll give it just another minute for, for questions coming in, but but Casey, I really appreciate um, the, the, the work that you've done. We do have a couple more questions coming in that we will use to, to wrap up the evening um, about whether, the, the first one is whether your work took into account the increased wildlife number uh, as a pair compared to, to earlier work. Um, so obviously there are some, some different wildlife conditions, there are some different um, external management in some of these areas where uh, wildlife have either been cultivated or fed or reintroduced. Did you see a lot of that impact in your work? Not particularly. We did have a couple um, producers that did have added expenses, especially when it came to um, fence maintenance or um, sometimes water maintenance um, in some of those facilities. But um, one producer does come to mind who had to replace his fence and um, provide materials way more often now that the, because in the winter, the elk would pretty much just come through and wipe down its fence. And with that added snow, especially on those forest service allotments where they can be higher elevation, you're gonna have higher snow, you're gonna maybe even have you know more elk population up there. And so he did have added expenses in that. And we did find that in other places too, just with more fence maintenance um, and watering facilities, because obviously wildlife use your facilities as well. So it's a little bit hard harder to disting distinguish that, but um, did take into account when we could those situations as well and did see it a little bit. Well, well, thank you so much, Casey. And, and I think we are at the top of the hour here. So we've had a couple other questions come in, but uh, what we'll do is we'll connect those individuals with you after the fact. Uh, but we're going to wrap up here um, th this evening. Uh, I'll turn it back to you just for any closing remarks. I would offer the same to Dr. Tanaka, and then we'll wrap up for this evening. Um, I think I've pretty much covered it, but just want to say thank you again, everybody, for having us um, and all the continued support. And yes, please, if anybody has any questions, um, I do, I would be more than happy to answer them, email, phone call, whatever. I do love talking about the project, especially now that I'm working full time, I kind of miss it. So um, feel, please feel free to send any of the questions my way. Yeah, so Caitlin, this is John. Again, thank you for all your support in this project and, you know, helping get Casey through this. Um, as, as she said, you know, I have to say this because she was my last graduate student before I retired. Actually, I was retired and she was my grad student. And then my first graduate student from Oregon State University is on the call as well, Amy Stilling. So she's with BLM down in Denver now, I think. So it's been fun. Well, well, thank you, Dr. Tanaka, for your 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 long um, your long history of of mentorship and and of bringing students through. Nicely done, Casey, and and thanks to all of you for joining us this evening. This video will be available on the Public Lands Council uh, website for later viewing, and we look forward to having you on our next webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you.